G'day everyone, welcome back to the AFL Come Down for round two, or the end of round two. And if you're unaware, this is a video where I sort of give my thoughts on every game that transpired over the given round, and I also incorporate your comments as well. So, if you go to the community tab on this YouTube channel, you'll find me ask every weekend, what are your takeaways from this week? And I will feature them in this video. So, let's go through the weekend action of footy. I think, uh, you know, early season rounds in particular are always a little bit more interesting. You know, we're still learning, we're still deciding whether... Our perceptions and preseason predictions are accurate and do we have the right vibe on teams and in some cases you know we're being proven wrong all of us and in some cases you know we're having our preconceived notions validated to some extent and I think this season for me and I'm sure many of you uh, you know it's a mix of everything once again a very interesting round before I get into the first game of the round St Kilda versus Collingwood I have noticed that the amount of people that watch my videos who are subscribed that is now up to 56% and that is a really healthy number normally it's below 50 so I want to thank everyone who's got on board if you could do me a favor if you are enjoying the content and you want to see more often daily but definitely weekly content this would be a great channel to subscribe to all right let's talk about St Kilda versus Collingwood this was a big game in the context of the season two sides that I have featuring in the finals and obviously the narrative around Collingwood right now heaps of pressure probably not enough said about St Kilda although the criticism on the whole is quite justified on Collingwood so I think they continue to struggle you know there's there's been a lot said in the media that I don't need to necessarily repeat but to summarize you know talk about some of the senior players in particular making fundamental errors you know damning footage of eh, slack running on defense etc Darcy Moore's not having a great season you know guys like Penderbury and Sidebottom have been particularly targeted and it's probably justified you know in particular Sidebottom's skill level I think has dropped away so far this year that can't be denied although I do kind of think that you know once players get to a certain age if they go through a dip in form there tends to then be an assumption that, that means it's the end of that player's career when you know they're probably prone to form slumps like everyone else it just seems like at Collingwood it's all happening at the same time but the pies are definitely in a spot of bother as we'll get to with the comments on this video and uh, season's very much on the line. They're absolutely fighting for their spot in the eight. Uh, one thing that I do think is going well for them is probably Darcy Cameron. Is he in career best form? He must be close. They've got a huge test next week at the Gabba. I'm not writing them off for that game, but there is every chance they go 0-4. Let's talk about the Saints though. I think they look, you know, every bit as good, if not better. I would say they've, they've actually impressed me with the way they've started the season. So copped a little bit of heat for not tipping them. You know, my justification was more that I just thought Collingwood would you know, eventually win one. But I have been big on the Saints. I've said that all off-season and I tipped them to finish fifth this year, but I was still impressed by this performance and they've got a lot of good, mature, dependable plays in that team, but, you know, the, the youth as well. There's a stack of youth that played well, you know, they play well every week, but in particular this game with Wanganine Miller, one of the best players of his type in the league, you know, with the predicted ascension of Kitty Coleman this year, obviously, unfortunately, he's done his ACL, but Wanganine Miller, similar sort of player is that skillful rebounding defender. He's one of the best in the game at what he does already. Windhager, Owens, King, these guys as well. I thought Max King looked very dangerous. This game has come at the cost of a few players though. Max King's been suspended for a week. Mason Wood uh, had that awful collision. And Liam Henry, I think, has done a hammy. But overall, I think this was a really, really good four points. As for the, some of the comments we got, we had Gus say, the Saints young guns keep getting better and the team keeps delivering, making most people eat their words. Agreed, that kind of echoes what I just said. Cardman22, one of the big dogs of the AFL YouTube scene, says the Saints have a top three young crop in the comp. I mean, it's hard to like strictly like write down and measure, um, but I think while I agree generally that they are extremely talented, what I think is happening here with the Saints is that broadly speaking, predicting whether young players are going to do well, usually the ones that do well in the early parts of their careers, it'd be down to a couple of factors. One is probably an outside game, and that's the ability to impact, um, you know, without necessarily needing to go and win your own footy. So we're talking about speed, endurance, skill, and it also helps to be in a good functioning team. And I think both of those things are true of St. Kilda's group. So Wangany Miller in particular, I mean, I'm not trying to undersell him because like I said, he's one of the best in the game at what he does now. Philippou, Darcy Wilson, they've got these attributes to be able to impact early and it helps that they're in a good team. So measuring them against other teams like Young Crop is hard hard, but I do generally agree. Like they do have some top end talent there. And someone like a Mashido Owens has genuinely played a hard role. So he's probably the outlier there. Skipper says it's early in the season, but the way Collingwood are looking at the moment could have major consequences if they don't set things up right now. Yeah. Like I said, I think they're playing for their spot in the eight at 0-3. I mean, how many wins do you need to make the top four? Like generously, I would say maybe you could have six losses max. So to be halfway there already hurts, um, especially if they don't beat Brisbane. And then Play On Footy says the Magpies have some big list decisions come the end of the season. I think that's definitely true you know I, I think there's probably going to be a number of veterans out of contract I think Pendlebury side bottom how uh, Hoskin Elliott as well he's I think 31 or will be 31 or something like that yeah but on the plus side that could give them you know some money to splash at some free agents or whatever AFL snaps also says 
Collingwood starting 0-3 could be season over if you're comparing to Geelong last year. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I wouldn't necessarily assume it's going to play out like Geelong last year, but I do think it's getting close to that point. Let's talk about Adelaide and Geelong. This game um, was, you know, it was both kind of horrific and really good at the same time. I said that jokingly at the time, but what I mean by that is it was a great game and two, you know, reasonably good sides, I would say. Uh, but some of the skill execution was horrific in this game. And I, I will probably say that it's probably down to conditions, but I think that Brody Smith shank is one of the worst uncontested, unpressured shanks I've ever seen. Milestone going for Tom Stewart, the guy just, you know, is as, is as good as he's ever been. Um, and he was, you know, he dropped mark of the year. I think uh, Max Hansen says top, Tom Stewart was centimeters away from mark of the year. It was one of the best marks of the year of the last decade if he had pulled it down. You know, I think this is a really good validating win for the Cats. Obviously, they're, they're a team that people famously like to pick to, to drop because of the age of their list. And, you know, to some extent, I feel a little validated for backing them. Into, I feel like I backed them in more than anyone outside of Geelong. On the other hand, though, I did only put them 11th, and the way they're playing right now, I think even I've undersold them. As for individuals in this game, I thought Myers' three goals, 26 possessions was good, but one player that might not get the uh, the flowers for this was Zach Guthrie. I thought there was plenty of times, particularly in that sort of last quarter and a half or so, just some really good defensive efforts, and probably was the difference in you know the ball going up Adelaide's way versus Geelong's. Has come at the cost, though, of potentially a danger field injury. That happened quite late. I don't know the extent of it. I feel like this week in particular was a bad weekend for injuries. There was a lot of, a lot of late ones, and thank God, like, touch wood. I don't think West Coast got me. And I only mention West Coast because usually it's it's us that's uh, on the wrong end of that. Gus says, the Cats look improved and refreshed, primed for a big season if all the old boys can keep fit. Yeah, it's hard to put you know, a, a real estimate on how good Geelong could be. They're playing like a final side. Again, I don't think contender, really, but, um, you know, they look like a final side to me. And the refresh part could be the fact that, you know, when was the last time they had a proper preseason like that? You know, if you play finals, obviously you finish the season later, you start preseason later. Could that be a factor here for the Cats? Play on footy makes the claim that the Crows are in some for some hard times ahead. I think that's a little bit of an overreaction. I think uh, they're in pretty good shape from a list point of view. They've just fallen short on a couple of occasions. Lost two close games. Um, too early to extrapolate. But yeah, this isn't the season, or at least this isn't the start of the season that we probably expected from the Crows. And they do have their work cut out for them a little bit to uh, try and get it back on track. But I wouldn't rule them out. Uh, Yitz says it was a mistake to re-sign Nick so early. Should have at least waited until the Crows had a few wins. Do you mean from like a PR point of view, like announcing it right now? I mean, I can kind of agree with that. I'd imagine this deal was probably negotiated, you know, a while ago. So from the outside looking in, I think Nix is doing a perfectly fine job. I know that, um, you know, like every team, there's uh, fans that don't like him at Adelaide. I think his resume stacks up and you've got to be patient. You know, they're not rebuilding as such anymore, but they're still on the climb and that's going to take time. Forgive me. I know that we're going to talk a little bit about more about some games than others. That's kind of down to how many comments each game gets. So we'll now talk about North and Fremantle and this was an interesting game uh, you know at half time this looked like North had sort of revived their early season form of last year and we're going to roll over Fremantle again but to, to Fremantle's credit I think they weathered the storm really well well that's evident they kicked nine goals in a row after trailing by 32 points and I do think that is a, a nice little uh, layer of validation over Fremantle's character I suppose if you want to call it that not to blow it out of proportion but you know the knock on Fremantle has been consistency and uh, you know they got seriously challenged in this game and they came back and won Luke Jackson is again you know, I think he's in all Australian form at the moment. Um, could be the best young ruck in the game. Probably on track to be the next best ruck in the game. Um, you know, and he's doing it in multiple positions. Sean Darcy goes out of the side. Luke Jackson plays in multiple positions again and, and does really well. So I'll shout him out. 10 score involvements for a big man. That's really impressive. Caleb's are wrong as well. Clearly an early contender for, well, he could have six Brownlow votes. I said during the week, I think this was a real danger game for Fremantle. And I did tip Fremantle for sure. Um, and they thankfully proved me right. But I was a little bit, uh, I wouldn't say nervous because it's not like I really care. But <laughs> I had my doubts and I spoke to Fremantle fans that felt the same way. But So I do think this is a really good win. As for North, you know, I think there's some real positives. The fact that they got in front at halftime um, and 32 points in front, you know, shows some growth. Shows they're competitive up and about early in the season. And um, yeah, you got to respect that. But to point at some individuals. So so obviously we know about the youngsters, McKercher, Dersma, and Wardlaw. Dersma was really good in this game, I thought, and it's probably exceeded my expectations to perform so early in the season. Wardlaw could walk away with the Rising Star nomination this week. I'm not too sure. Harvey Thomas did well in the uh, GWS West Coast game. But I want to point out a few more middle-tier players that are playing well for the Roos. So Tristan Cherry, I think, has you know made a really good start to the season. And some of the midfielders, like in particular Tom Powell, um, who's had a really good fortnight to start the season. Uh, we know Bailey Scott's a good player. Will Phillips as well has sort of quietly become more reliable. LDU had nine clearances. So it's that layer of middle-aged players there 
that is making me a little bit more confident about North. Again, we just need to see them sustain it for longer throughout a season, but uh, you know, some really good green shoots there. The history of Apple says the Dockers will be top four guaranteed. Um, I can't agree with that. I don't know if it's a little bit tongue in cheek. I don't think top four guaranteed, um, but they're two and oh, and you know, they look all right. They look pretty good. Hawthorne versus Melbourne. This game got no comments. And uh, to be honest, I don't know how much there is to say about it. Um, obviously Melbourne far too good, in particular dominated Hawthorne's midfield. Five goals to nothing in the first term, I believe it was. Interestingly, Hawthorne had 52 uncontested marks in the first quarter, but they didn't kick a goal. They were dominating clearances 11 to 1, and then the inside 50s 14 to 5. So th those are all the stats that really need to tell you exactly how this game sort of played out. Again, we're talking about a potential premiership contender against a rebuilding side. So I don't know how many learnings there are from that, other than, you know, Josh Weddle, I thought was really good for the Hawks. Um, Nick Watson kicked his first goal after six behinds. Bailey Fritch kicked five goals. Melbourne's midfield fired. Melbourne have come back fairly strongly after that opening round loss to the Swans. Obviously, that's uh, in hindsight is not looking too bad considering Sydney have been really good since but it did come at the cost of Stephen May's broken ribs Jake Lever sore knee didn't play in the last quarter I don't know how serious that is we'll wait to see but uh, that could could have a serious impact on this season if those guys miss, you know, a significant amount of football. Swans on the Bombers, we live streamed here on the True Footy YouTube channel. I thought this was a good game, to be honest. Um, you know, Sydney win by five goals. Thought Tom Papley probably gets three votes. He had like 88 fantasy points at halftime, four goals, 20 odd possessions. Uh, but then the usual sort of string of suspects you'd expect from Sydney, like Chad Warner's had an amazing start to the year. And Isaac Heaney might have even bettered him. I'm not too sure, actually. A lot of talk about Heaney, a little bit about Warner. I think the gap's pretty close between those two. And Golden as well, stuck out with his transition game. There's footage of him, like, kicking it from the back pocket and then running the length of the field to deliver an inside 50. Considering the opponent here and the fact that it was, you know, away from home, I think Essendon really held their own in this game. Zach Merritt has been a warrior, you know, for a long period of time, but uh, he tried to lift them back into this game. You know, Jay Gresham has also made a really good start to his career at Essendon, I think. I think he had three goals, 23 touches, I think four tackles. I think Essendon put up a good fight. From the outside looking in, not looking at what uh, fans are saying out there. I think considering the opponent, considering the momentum Sydney have, considering you know we're uncertain about Essendon, I was more impressed than anything else that they were within this game for three quarters and Sydney sort of kicked away a little bit at the end. Gus says, Sydney looked destined for finals again, playing free-flowing footy, Golden is a stud, and moving Heaney into the midfield was a masterstroke. Yeah, Heaney could have some serious Brownlow votes at this point. Um, you know, Golden obviously is a stud. I still don't think, you know, I don't think he's hit the heights of the year last year, but they've got so much depth there that they're going to have a headache when all those good players come back. LD Sports says, Heaney, Brownlow, and Papley common because why not? Oh, and he says flag swam. Uh, I think that was a bit tongue-in-cheek, but Heaney could be leading the brown low considering um, it's early in the season, which just reminds me as well, that's all going to be out of whack with opening round, the brown low medal count. Play on footy says the Bombers are pretenders and won't play finals footy again this year. This is an interesting take. I think this is a harsh take from this game. I don't have Essendon in, in the finals, uh, but I don't think I saw that in this game. I think they put up a reasonable fight. Sunday games now, Bulldogs versus Gold Coast. Um, this one was one-sided and I didn't expect it to be. You know, I, I did tip the Bulldogs, but, um, you know, I thought there was a good chance that it was a danger game for them. Gold Coast made a great start to the year. I feel like they beat them in Ballarat a couple of years ago, something like that. And the Bulldogs make a statement kicking nine goals in the first term. Cody Waitman helps himself to six. And, you know, there's a bit of talk about um, beverage pressure, etc., like that. I, I think there was probably a little bit of an overreaction to their loss to Melbourne. I, I thought, you know, Melbourne are a good side and they fell away in the last quarter. And they've definitely impressed me in this game. Like they've, they've played really well and I, I'm, you know, nervous as an Eagles fan playing them next week. But as far as I'm concerned, you know, Beverage should be on more or less on a clean slate and uh, assess the Bulldogs on this year. And from the two games so far, it's probably par for expectations. Losing to a genuine premiership contender, beating a team that's trying to prove themselves as a finals contender. Playing footy says, you know, Beverage saves his coaching job for now. You know, I don't think it should be public opinion should be swinging that wildly. I think Bulldogs are probably about where we've expected. Some really good signs though. Obviously, Bontempelli, 10 clearances, two goals, maybe three votes there again. Uh, Darcy as well. Sam Darcy kicking in two goals. Doesn't seem to me too much doubt this card's ready for AFL level now after a few years of developing. Caulfield's shoulder injury sounds quite serious. Well, when I say sounds serious, I mean the footage of him tearing up on the boundary line was a bit heartbreaking. Does imply that it'll be out for a little while. Um, and Ed Richards has that concussion as well. So a few availability questions there for the Bulldogs, but uh, overall, I don't think they're going to be in too much danger next week. Richmond played Port Adelaide at the MCG. Port got the job done by five goals. The biggest win is not seeing Port Adelaide's charcoal or grey jump or whatever it is. Sorry, it just grinds my gears. Uh, Boak also played 350 games, which is outstanding. I think he's the 23rd player to ever do that. So uh, remarkable career. I mean, that guy got drafted like 
God, I want to say like a year after Josh Kennedy. But anyway, you know, Richmond, um, they're dealing with a little bit of adversity um, in terms of availability as much as anything else. They had three tall defenders out for this game. You know, Gibkiss did the ACL. Nathan Broad and Tyler Young also missed. Um, and as a result, Port Adelaide's key forwards in this game kind of got the hold of them. But it was an interesting interesting battle where Port were a bit ina- inaccurate to start the game. Richmond's second quarter made it look like they were going to run over the top of them. Shea Bolton was fantastic, as was Liam Baker. Three goals, 23 possessions. There's some definite competitiveness and, and spark to Richmond at the moment. So while the results aren't there, while there's injuries, I don't think Uze's made a bad start by any stretch. Port Adelaide got the MCG win that, uh, well, they needed to. I think this uh, would have been a bad game to lose, but they won by five goals, proving that they're, you know, not too far off the pace from last year. They haven't had the toughest opponents, in my opinion, yet, but things seem to be chugging along okay. Rosie and Butters were strong in this game. Kane Farrell as well, really good out of the back half. Todd Marshall kicked four goals. So, again, we haven't really learned too much about Port Adelaide, but, you know, they haven't stuttered yet. Boomer Star also points out that uh, Liam Baker is arguably the most underappreciated, underrated players in the league. Possibly. I mean, we all think that about very his plays on our team, but I would probably agree that he's a little bit underrated. And he's certainly a good player, and he's going to look wonderful in blue and gold next year. And finally, the game you're all waiting for, West Coast versus GWS at Optus Stadium. We saved the best for the last, and uh, yeah, uh, surprise, surprise, GWS, the probably the best team in the comp, in my opinion, or at least the team that I picked to win the Premiership, and along with Sydney, has impressed me as much as anyone else. Um, they were far too good for a West Coast side that does not have a lot of uh, people back in the minute at the moment. You know, it was an interesting game, you know, to contrast West Coast performance against Port Adelaide. I think, strangely, I think West Coast probably threatened GWS at times more than they threatened Port Adelaide, but GWS were very, very good at just stifling West Coast ball movement, forcing errors. Sometimes they were unforced, but their pressure was consistent. And then when they went forward, they would generally score in a very calculated and proficient way. And uh, we were talking about on the stream, you know, is GWS playing well? You know, are they in fifth gear? You know, they certainly weren't in fifth gear, but what they did do was consistently bring pressure, consistently force mistakes, and consistently burn West Coast on the transition. And were able to put, you know, a big score on the board, 108 in the modern game is quite good. And, uh, you know, West Coast didn't score a goal between the second and third terms, but it wasn't a through lack of effort. It was just literally that we couldn't get the ball out of our back half and GWS are far too strong. So you can get my in-depth thoughts on the Eagles on the True Eagle channel. Um, but as for some individuals, Tom Green was monstrous for the for the Giants. Lockie Whitfield, Josh Kelly, no real surprises there. Really good players. Harvey Thomas, you know, maybe made a late charge for a rising star nomination. He had 21 touches and a goal, I think, as well. 90-odd fantasy points. He might have even turned up, actually. And, you know, we had two number one draft picks playing this game, and both were really good. The, the two previous as number one draft pick. So Cadman in particular, I think, uh, you know, great mark, Ronald Siren basically, kicked the final goal of the game. He kicked three for the day. Looks like a jet. And Harley Reid as well, particularly in the first quarter. I think he had eight or nine touches to quarter time. And, um, you know, with far more time on ball this week, we saw flashes of what both of these guys are going to bring in AFL level for a while. Billy 75 Chook says the Giants need to smash the lower teams. Giants don't know how to smash teams. Uh, I mean, 65 points is pretty healthy. I think, um, yeah, I think there's just this belief with West Coast. It's oh, just because it's West Coast, it should be 100. But I mean, that, that hasn't been true. We've played two pretty good teams and GWS did enough. I think this was still a pretty big win, to be honest. Play on footy says Reed is the shining light for the Eagles in 2024. I mean, sure. I, I like to think that uh, there's a few more than that, particularly youth. I think like Ruben Jinby played his best game for the club uh, in this game, but there's no doubt Harley Reed is the, the brightest. And finally, more of a general comment from Sir Carl. Uh, the use of VAR has been a joke this week. Uh, VAR is more of a Premier League term, so that's obviously the goal review system. It says, can't remember the last time I saw it so poorly used. I can't say I noticed maybe it is as much as you can, but definitely there were a few ca- few occasions where they just reviewed things that clearly didn't need to be reviewed. That was probably present in every game I watched, so you're right. It does seem like a little bit of an overreaction from the Adelaide to Sydney thing. There has been a few that you're just like, how on earth could you review that? But anyway, guys, those are my thoughts on round two. Thank you so much for your contributions. Like I said, if you want to contribute to this show, um, you know, comment on the community tab. I'll probably release it every Sunday morning. So keep an eye out for that if you want to contribute. Also comment down below your thoughts on this week. Footy tips will be out tomorrow, um, as well as my Eagles thoughts. That's probably going to be out fairly soon today by the time you're watching this. But anyway, thank you for watching. Thank you for being subscribed and I'll see you in the next one. Cheers.